my lovelies, today's video is going to be my January and February reads for 2020. Yes, I know this is incredibly late, but I was in my final stages of my final year of my degree, so I didn't have time to keep up with monthly reads, but I'm coming back to them now. I've actually split this into three sections instead of doing it chronologically. That's because I had two modules, my British Sci-Fi and Fantasy module and my Jane Austen module, and I also managed to read three books for myself, so I'm going to go with these three books first. The books that I read for myself all ended up being really good books. I read the first one, Pantomime, right at the beginning before my term started, and I read the other two after my required reading for my modules was finished. The first book I read right at the beginning of January is Pantomime by Laura Lamb, which is the first book in the Miku Dray trilogy. It is about this steampunk Victorian world where magic has been lost, and this character called Jean, who is both male and female, and when her higher social life starts to get constraining, they run away to join the circus under the name Miku Grey. Although it seemed to start off quite mundane, just describing the circus, it ended up a book that was unlike anything I've ever read before. It dipped slightly in the middle when the flashbacks of Jean's old life stopped, but other than that, the explosive ending really made up for this little dip. I would have liked the relationship to have been developed a little bit more, but I'm otherwise really excited to see the magical lore that wasn't really developed in this book be developed more in the next book, and just to see how Jean develops themselves, but otherwise this book was absolutely explosive and I really enjoyed it. Overall I gave this 4.5 stars because it was absolutely brilliant in its idea, just that tiny little dip in the middle dropped that 0.5 star and the magical lore not being quite explored yet was that 0.5 star. The next book was actually the Filling My Shelf Book Club book for December but because the whole term's worth of reading interrupted me in between it actually took me about three months to read it. I had really broken up reads at the start but then after all my university reading was finished I really been read the second half. This is The Miniaturist by Jessie Burton and it is set in 1686 Amsterdam where Nella Portman is newly married to the kind yet distant merchant trader Johannes Brandt who buys her her cabinet sized replica of their own home. Nella hires a miniaturist to furnish the house but the little miniatures ended up being eerily similar to their real life counterparts and this uncovers some unusual secrets. When I did get the chance to pick up this book, I was really enthralled in it. Jessie Burton has a really great talent of doing chapter endings that make you want to read straight on to the next. I kind of thought there was going to be something supernatural about this, but it ended up being about really more historically accurate to the characters' lives, and it went in places that I didn't expect, and that was actually really thrilling. I feel like I need to reread it to pick up all the hints of all these different plot points that I just wasn't expecting it to go. Because I had the feeling Jessie Burton was trying to stick to it being more historically accurate, it didn't shy away from some harsh truths, and it actually ended up being the miniatures herself that I lost interest in because all the other plot points were really brilliant and really engaging. So I ended up giving the miniatures by Jessie Burton 4.5 stars. And the very last book that I finished in February was The Lost Princess by Connie Glynn, which is the third book in the Rosewood Chronicles. The Rosewood Chronicles is about the Rosewood School, which is a boarding school for children of either important people or royals from around the world. We follow two main characters, one of which is Ellie Pumpkin, who is normal at the start of the series, and actually gets into the school through a very rare scholarship, and she roommates with Ellie Wolf, who is the Princess of Mardovia. Lottie ends up becoming the portman to Ellie, which means she pretends to be the Princess of Mardovia until Ellie is ready to actually move into society and be revealed to society. And the third book is actually set in Rosewood Sister School in Japan. And this book very much furthers the plot of this sinister group that is actually trying to target the children of these important people that are very often at the Rosewood School. Now, I really love this book. There's something about the way Connie Glynn writes in this series that is just such a comfort for me. I loved that we actually got more angst in this book and the relationship between the characters began to complicate as well. Plus this whole bigger plot of this sinister group outside the school is starting to deepen and the new villain character is very much eerie and I really liked that and it ended on a cliffhanger with that. Connie also manages to avoid the trap of setting each book in the new school year by having it set in the summer school at the sister school in Japan and I absolutely love Japan and I know Connie's got a really big interest in Japan from watching her YouTube videos so overall I just loving this book I'm loving the characters even if they're not getting along with each other right now and it had a really good cliffhanger ending so I've given this five stars like I have with all the other Rosewood books because I love them and this is the first sort of series I dedicated myself to hardback in I have it signed Next I'm going to be going through the books I read for my British sci-fi and fantasy module, starting with the two H.G. Wells book. I should have also read The War of the Worlds, but I was running out of time, so I didn't read it and just relied on my knowledge of the Jeff Brain radio play. But the first book by H.G. Wells was The Time Machine. The Time Machine is about an English scientist who travels to the year 802701, where humans have evolved to be two races. The Eloy, who are elegant and peaceful, but kind of like unknowledgeable, that live on the upper end of the earth, 
and you also have the Morlocks that live underground on, and are an industrial lace. I actually read this by listening to the audio H.G. Wells science fiction collection and this one specifically was read by Hugh Bonneville. I didn't feel here nor there about this book, the commentary of the Morlocks was interesting but anything outside that, any other parts of the story I just wasn't engaged in. The scientists also felt really quick to make an em enemy of the Morlocks and I definitely would have struggled with the scientific jargon that came with it if I was reading this for myself instead of listening to it. So I've only given this three stars. The next H.G. Welsh book is The Island of Dr. Monroe. This is about a man who is shipwrecked on Dr. Monroe's island where Dr. Monroe does these horrible experiments trying to turn animals into people and humans. I also listened to this one with the audiobook collection and this one was actually read by Jason Isaacs. This has got to be one of my least favourite books I read for this term. I feel like it only took one book for me to be really fed up and exhausted of H.G. Wells' writing and I've decided that I actually don't like the way he writes action at all. This seemed too fanciful and Wells seems to be really formulaic in the way he writes that is dehumanising anyone who isn't the intellectual male protagonist. Although I like the law of the land section of this, I really feel like this had too many coincidental plot points and it really could have been shorter so I only gave this 2.5 stars. The next book we read was The Story of the Amulet by E. Nesbitt. This is actually the third book in the Five Children It series and this was something that was really annoying about this module is that we jumped in mid-series for a lot of books. And this time the children once again meet the creature called the Samoyed or Samoyed. And this time they've got half an amulet which can take them to any time or any place and they need to find the other half of the amulet. I felt unmotivated to pick this up at the start but after a while the writing did start to become quite charming. The trouble with children's book is I don't actually like the pacing in children's books and the plot wasn't actually too gripping. I don't normally like it when books don't give you explanations for things or explanations of how things work but this brushes it off in a really cute way and they also finish the book having no idea what the Sami like actually looked like and I still can't even say what this creature is meant to be so I gave this 3.5 stars because there were some charming moments in it and I liked the way that we went to different cultures because you went to Atlantis and you went to ancient Egypt and it was all these different times and places but it was very also British colonial sort of places. The next book I need to give trigger warnings for Salt and Sexual Assault and that's The Magic Toy Shop by Angela Carter and it's about these recently orphaned children who have to move in with their uncle who owns a toy shop and he also creates puppets and there's this really weird sort of twisted narrative where things are not quite magical realism. I was really enjoying the book right up until that whirlwind of a final chapter which left me feeling thoroughly uneasy and with so many questions but Carter's writing was really a highlight. She had really nailed that ability to make you feel disturbed and really feel uneasy and uncomfortable through it all. I originally said that if the ending had gone somewhere else I would have rated it higher but I ended up writing on the magic toy shop along with Peter Pan for my essay and now that ending just seems to make sense or at least it did for my argument as well as the fact that the book actually stayed with me for quite a while after I read it I kept thinking about it a lot so I think I'd actually rate this a four stars instead of the 3.5 stars that I originally put on Goodreads but I now I really want to rate it four stars and I definitely think I need to read more Angela Carter for just that really horrible and easy uncomfortable feel that she managed to do. So the title and the cover is quite misleading. It is a lot more twisted than the childish looking title would make it seem. I paired The Magic Toy Shop with Peter Pan for my essay by J.M. Barry. This is about a boy that won't grow up who chases his shadow into the Darling Nursery after standing outside the window to listen to Wendy's stories and she en he ends up taking the Darling Children to Neverland where there's fairies and pirates and red Indians and mermaids. It's just all very magical. I hadn't actually read the book before reading it for this module, but I loved everything Neverland. So the stories and the characters I've got such an attachment to, which makes me override the issues that this book actually has. There's some problematic moments with gender and race, which haven't aged well since this book was published in 1911 and we've had more than 110 years since then. So that really didn't age well. A critical reader would have definitely have dropped stars for the way it handles those sort of things but because I'm reading this with a complete and utter nostalgic indulgence I haven't. I would have liked to have there to have been more hook and more tink in it and the pirate ship ending was a little bit anticlimactic but I found myself actually knowing what the lines are going to be before I'd even read them and this was just held so much nostalgic joy for me reading this. That I just can't not giving it anything other than five stars. I also love the fact that it appeals to the very different types of my personality. As you can see there's pink and there's purple but there's also a skeleton standing right there that you can't see. So I love the fact that this book has so many layers like on the surface it's a magical and whimsical story but when you start to read it deeper 
and see more layers in it, it can actually be quite morbid and disturbing when you read into it further. And the ending of this book just gave me all the feels and so does the book The Hori Around. So I can't give this anything but five stars. It has to be a five star read for me. The next book was actually The Wind and the Wills by Kenneth Graham. And this is about English countryside animals as if they were like late Victorian gentlemen and all their misadventures such as Toe from Toes Hall and his motor car. I'm glad to have taken this one off the list because it is charming in its like countryside motifs but it hasn't got much going for it after that. The story sometimes felt disconnected although I like the fact that it always circled back around to Toad. The dynamics of the world are probably best not thinking about because the blurred lines between human and animal are really weird and yeah best not just think about that. The main point with this book is that I didn't really want to pick it up every time I put it down no matter how charming and whimsical it seems so I've only given this book three stars. And then we read another children's book, which is The Worst Witch by Jill Murphy, which is about Mildred Hubble, who is a trainee witch at Miss Cackle's Witch Academy, but she's making an awful mess of this. And all I can really say about this, because it's really sure as a children's book, is that Baby Bat Me would have loved it because the illustrations are so nice and it's got all those spooky elements. So it's just a really pleasing, quick kids book to get through. And I kind of want to read the rest of it. So Little Baby Bat Gothic Me would have really liked this. So I've given it a solid four stars. And then there's another book which is actually midway through the series and that is The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis which is actually the sixth book in the Chronicles of Narnia series when you read it in story order. This one actually follows the story of Caspian's son Prince William and Aslan calls in Eustace and his school friend Jill to actually come find Prince William and there is an enchantress who's getting in the way of it all. Considering I haven't read the other Chronicles of Narnia books and I was having to jump in at book six I actually found this really engrossing to get through and I ended up knowing a lot of the references to the other books from the movies, but you could also manage to read this on its own without feeling too interrupted. The dynamics of Narnia are just so interesting and I wasn't expecting to actually be heartbroken by this book in any way at all. Although there are moments when it actually the language is a little bit jarring and it makes you remember that it's a kid book, I've got my notes here. But other than those jarring moments when you really remember it's a kid's book, the writing in this is actually quite fluid and immersive. There are some annoying gender roles to do with Jill, considering this was written in the 50s. But other, other than that, I actually really enjoyed it, considering it's book six. And I loved it so much that I want to actually read the rest of the Chronicles of Narnia now. So I've given this 4.5 stars. The final book we read for my British sci-fi and fantasy module was John Wyndham's Chocky. This is about an 11 year old boy Matthew who has an imaginary friend called Chocky. But Chocky asks really difficult questions about human progress, such as not understanding why people have gender and the role of gender. And then Matthew starts to act in a way where Chocky seems to be more of an interactive presence than an imaginary friend. I thought this was a brilliant concept that was well executed, if a tiny bit info dumpy at the end. It was really thought provoking, although the writing sometimes I struggled to get into and felt a little bit resistant to the writing, but otherwise I thought this was great concept, good execution and a solid four star book. And then we have my Jane Austen module and obviously we, what we were going to do was read all of Jane Austen's works, except for the fact that we had University Strike, so the very last book that was on teaching, which was Persuasion, ended up being taken out by Strike, so I didn't end up reading that. And the way I read most of these was through audiobooks, so I could keep up with the very heavy reading schedule I had between this module and the other module. So because we read them in writing order, poor old Persuasion got left on the end when the strikes took out the last weeks of teaching time, but I am going to be reading this on my own at some point because I really want to finish it and I was enjoying the Austin books. The first book I've got here is Northanger Abbey, which also has Lady Susan the Watsons and Sandington in it, which are Jane Austen's unpublished work because we also studied them. Northanger Abbey is about young Catherine Morland, who is obsessed with gothic novels. So when she is introduced to society, she starts seeing the events of her life as if they were a gothic novel. With it being one of the first few things I read of Austen, because I hadn't read Austen before this module, I was really surprised by the wit and sarcasm in this, and I enjoyed the parodying of gothic novel as well as indulging in Catherine's like ideas of gothic novel, even though I know nothing sinister is actually going to happen. I really felt with Catherine and I really was ir irritated by John w John Thorpe. I found it really brilliant that Jane Austen had written a character like John Thorpe which I was actually genuinely interested by. I only wish things didn't happen so much outside of our character even though that did make for some good reveals at the end if they were a little bit too quick. So I've given Northanger Abbey a solid four stars because I did really enjoy the wit and sarcasm in it. Then we also read Lady Susan, which is a short novel that was written in letter form. So you have this character, Lady Susan, who is a relative who is coming in and meddling with things and scheming and all these different letters of people back chatting each other and talking about each other behind the back. And I really enjoyed the fact that 
we had a character who seemed devious for the sake of devious, is what I originally said. But after discussing it in the seminars, you saw there's much more layers to it. But it's just it's just the fact that they were all talking about each other behind each other's backs in these letters that I found really amusing. So I gave Lady Susan the unpublished sort of no epistolary novella four stars. There was also two pieces of unfinished works at the back which are the Watsons and Sanditon. I enjoyed the Watsons more because that was following a family which is a lot lower status than what Austin usually writes about and I thought that could have been really intriguing but there was only so many pages of that because she actually don't writing about that she wasn't sure where she could actually go with someone who if you start really low at the bottom. We also had Sanditon which is like a spa retreat beach town but I really struggled to get into the actual small sections that we have of Sanditon. I found it really fragmented and it's a bit more economical so I wasn't enjoying that one so much but I would give both of them a sort of three star range. So overall this collection with the Northanger Abbey, Lady Susan the Watsons and Sanditon fragments in it I'd give a solid four stars. The next book is Sense of Sensibility, which is about the Dashwood sisters and their mother. And because of how inheritance is so male orientated, they've ended up with no fortune and no connections of their own when they move into this cottage. Eleanor is concerned for others and social proprieties, whereas Marianne is all about feeling, hence why it is Sense and Sensibility. It was really charming in its beginnings and there are plenty of twists and reveals to keep me interested in it. Sometimes the conversations between characters seem to be going the long way around instead of just getting to the point, but they were still interesting enough. I would have liked to see more development with which man each Dashwood, Dashwood sister actually ended up with. And I also thought the way information was revealed to Eleanor and the way she reacted to it was a little repetitive, but otherwise this is still one of the good ones and I rated this four stars and enjoyed it. The next is the one, the only, Pride and Prejudice. And with the arrival with eligible young men into the neighbourhood, the lives of the Bennets and their five daughters ends up being turned upside down and inside out with Elizabeth Bennet being the most resistant to the marriage matching process. I really regret the way I read this because I had so much reading to do this term. I actually ended up cramming 43 out of 61 chapters in one day of the 11 hour audio book. So that really disrupted the reading process. And so in order to finish it for the seminar, I really had to rush through it and that just made it a lot less enjoyable than it would be. So I would have rated this a lot higher if I could just have sat back and enjoyed it a lot. And I actually really enjoyed writing about it. This, I wrote my essay for my Austin module on Pride and Prejudice and it actually ended up being the best essay I ever wrote, marks wise. So I enjoyed pulling it apart. I just having to cram it so much to get it to read it for the seminar just wasn't an enjoyable way to read this book. Reading exhaustion meant that I lost interest in the middle a little bit and there's something about the story that just wasn't what I expected because I hadn't seen the movie either before I read this but otherwise I really liked the conversations that happened in this book a lot. I liked the sort of teasing of Mr Bennett and the confrontation of Lizzie and Lady Catherine at the end was just glorious so I've given this 3.5 to 4 stars because of the horrible way I ended up reading it but I suspect if I sat down and read it for myself and because of the way I read it, wrote in it for essays, as you can see, this was my essay book, I would have definitely have rated it higher. But for now, it's just having to stay at a really annoying 3.5 to 4 star level. But I will reread this at some point. And the next written book is Mansfield Park. And that is about Fanny Price, who at 10 years old, moves away from her poverty stricken home in Portsmouth to move in with the wealthy family of her uncle, Bertram. Yes. And she ends up falling in love with her cousin Edmund until the Crawfords arrived and start turning things upside down and interrupting everything. I'd heard bad things about the plot for this one. It's meant to be like the one people like the least out of Austin's work, but I ended up not thinking the plot was that bad. There was quite a lot of padding around the plot that could have been cut out and I zoned out a little bit in those places. Again, this was one of the books I had to cram to get it read for a seminar, so I've sort of forgotten a lot of what happens in it, which is a shame because I zoned out quite a bit on this one. There's also a lot of talking around the plot instead of actually engaging with the plot. There's a cat trying to come back in again. But Fanny Price's situation as being somebody who still has that poverty-stricken poverty -stricken family still existing and she goes back to visit that family. I thought that was a really intriguing process. And her relationship of Fanny with Edmund and the way that they interacted was also interesting, if a little bit rushed at the end. And I actually... Because of the way I crammed reading this book for the seminar, I actually cannot remember the last two chapters very well. Because of me zoning out and just cramming to get this book read for a seminar, I've given this 3.5 stars.
And the last book that we actually got to read and study is my favourite out of all the Austen books I read, and that is Emma, which is about Emma Woodhouse, who thinks herself a bit of a matchmaker, although she's a little bit oblivious to her actual love life that's happening to her and blunders away through society and ends up making all these comedic little matchmaking moments. This is more light-hearted with Emma's matchmaking and her meddling in things and I also felt that this read a lot clearer. I like the fact that it poked fun and it was often very amusing and because it's actually very biased to Emma's point of view it made it a really guessing, good guessing game to try and figure out who these characters actually like because Emma thinks she knows everything but she doesn't really. So that meant there was a lot of moments where you're sort of rolling your eyes at Emma's thought process but I really enjoyed this and I would have actually have liked Emma to have meddled a bit more so I've given this 4.5 stars and it's such a shame that we didn't get actually to read Persuasion. That is the big stack of reading that I did in January and February. A lot of it is required reading so I only got three books of my own read in and by March my reading had completely dropped because of reading exhaustion from having to read so many for university and then essays and stuff happening at that time. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching, like, comment, subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.